Joining me now, Ginkgo Bioworks co-founder and CEO, Jason Kelly. Ginkgo Bioworks is focused on bioengineering aimed at streamlining testing and vaccine distribution. And Jason, I know that you've been working with some of these most prominent, uh, the folks making these most prominent vaccine candidates on their manufacturing process. First of all, what is your reaction to the news out of Pfizer today in terms of when we will actually see this on the market when just regular people can get a vaccine? Yeah, I mean, I think you will see these, you know, coming on the market in December and January. Uh, you know, it's interesting to hear Stefan from from Moderna say, you know, it's not a silver bullet. I, I think I think that's very true at a population scale coming up. Um, but it, it's really exciting, you know, the the results from from Pfizer and Moderna for a new type of vaccine, which is what these nucleic acid vaccines are. I don't think anyone would have predicted those, uh, you know, ninety five percent efficacy or nearly ninety five percent efficacy. That that's. The, the bio nerd in me is, uh, is very excited about that. So uh, let's talk about, I know you've been doing work with Moderna, for example, on their right. max vaccine manufacturing process. We just spoke with the uh, co-founder and chair of Moderna earlier this week. They also had some positive news. You know, talk to us about how that process is going and how you see getting these vaccines to people uh, around the world at scale. Yeah, that is the key question coming up. So now that we know these things work, it's, you know, how do you get them out there? Not just to, you know, 300 million Americans, but, you know, nearly 8 billion people worldwide. And, you know, the, the, chat, the good thing about the nucleic acid vaccines is they're fast to develop, right? And, and their efficacy has been, you know, just incredible. Uh, the, the bad thing is we're, we're deploying them at scale for the first time. So the, so the supply chain isn't as, as sort of robust as, as it, more traditional vaccines. And so you are seeing these, these big crash programs uh, to fund and expand that infrastructure. And I think now that we know these vaccines work, you will see, you know, whether it's what you're seeing in Europe um, or even more in the, here in the U.S., people doubling down and tripling down on, on, on meeting that supply need. So some folks are saying, OK, for emergency use in December, that is great. But we are going into a long winter, 200,000 yep. new cases a day. The CDC advising people not to travel on Thanksgiving here in California. I have a 10 yeah. o'clock curfew. I mean, are these vaccines yep. going to be available too late to people like me? Yeah, no, I, I think it's a I, I think that is exactly the right thing for us to be talking about. Um, you know, I think one of the things, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Burks actually mentioned at the coronavirus press conference yesterday was uh, starting in areas where prevalence is lower, places like California, can we start doing um, uh, surveillance testing? She called them sentinel populations, where you're testing people without symptoms weekly, whether that's in schools and nursing homes, workplaces. How do we start looking for the virus even when someone's not displaying symptoms? And, and to me, that's the in-between technology, between now and the vaccine being widely available, which you know, Dr. Fauci said, widely available in April, you know, and I think where we would have really the whole, uh, nearly the whole population vaccinated would be more like the tail end of next year if we really pushed it. In the interim, we have to deploy that sort of surveillance testing of people without symptoms. Uh, I think uh, Bill Gates mentioned it there too as well, that, that's exactly right. Now, once the vaccines are ready, you have talked about how, you know, as you say, this mRNA technology is completely new to the vaccine world. But once we do it uh, this time, it means we can do it again more easily next time. How do you see these vaccines actually changing the vaccine creation, development and production landscape, landscape forever? Yeah, th that's the silver lining here, right? You know, I, I, th I think this is now the new normal. Um, I think our ability to rapidly respond to an emerging infectious disease, and you know, in a matter of, of months, is proven now. Uh, I think you will see people try these new mRNA vaccines, even for things like flu, um, uh, coming up in the future. So, so we'll we'll have to see. But but I think one of the great things here is the the toolbox for how to respond to um, infectious disease has just expanded dramatically. And I hope we actually use this to kind of clean up some of the infectious diseases worldwide, right? You know, infectious disease, maybe in the developing countries, shows up once every 100 years with a pandemic, but we still have infectious disease uh, creating enormous uh, uh, negative impact worldwide in, in um, low and middle income countries. And these tools, hopefully, will we'll also be able to help there post-pandemic. 
Now, there are still concerns about the storing of the Pfizer vaccine in these super cold temperatures that most freezers are not capable of. Moderna doesn't have the same problem. But talk to us about your role in the, the, your technology yeah. and your technology's role in that process from getting from point A to point D. Yeah, so, so, so these, the way these mRNA vaccines work is you have to have a piece of RNA that gets delivered to the body and gets in your cell, makes a piece of the, the virus, and then your immune system responds. But the manufacturing challenge is how do you get that RNA? And there's basically two steps. You grow cells in a big tank, almost like a brewery. And inside every cell is a little piece of DNA that has the code for a piece of the virus. You grow it up, you pull the DNA out, and then you put that DNA in the lab, you add some enzymes, and you turn it into RNA. And then the RNA goes into the vaccine. Well, those two steps are the two steps we're working on, both making how you run that brewery more efficient so you get more DNA per batch. And then secondly, those enzymes that you use to convert the DNA to the RNA, those are usually just used for like behind me in the lab by scientists at the bench. We now need tons of this stuff to actually be able to produce billions of doses of the vaccine. That, that's more than anyone's ever made of these types of enzymes. And that's a new production process. We're working on that as well.